Um, our next speaker is um, Dr. DeMarco. Dr. DeMarco is a clinical neuropsychologist with St. Luke's University Health Network. He received a doctoral degree at Yeshep, how do you say that? Yeshiva. Yeshiva yeah. University and his po yeah. post po <laughs> postdoctoral uh, fellowship in neuropsychology at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. His experience includes assessing the neurocognitive, emotional, and behavioral system sy symptoms of a wide range of neurological disorders, including epilepsy, traumatic brain injury, concussions, and Parkinson's, along with general medical conditions. He's a member of the American Psychological Association and the American Epilepsy Society. Please join me in welcoming Dr. DeMarcos. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah? All right, thank you. All right, so you had Dr. Marcos and Dr. D. Marco. It's not too complicated, right? It's not. I was actually just thinking about that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not. not it's easy. No, it's easy. It makes it easier. It's kind of grouping. How many people have heard of a neuropsychologist or have encountered a neuropsychologist? Yeah, we're curious creatures. We, uh, we have a bit of uh, identity uh, issues. We don't know if we want to be neurologists, psychologists, psychiatrists. Uh, so we just do it all together. Um, uh, when people come to see me, they often don't know what to expect. You know, they expect people waiting in white jackets or they expect a couch where they can lay down and start telling me uh, all their problems and about their childhood, but that's not what we do. Within epilepsy, neuropsychologists focus on the assessment of, of thinking abilities. Memory, attention, concentration, language, because we know that these can be impacted in epilepsy, but we also focus on the assessment of emotional symptoms, depression, anxiety, um, and other psychiatric symptoms, because we know that individuals with epilepsy are at an increased risk for these symptoms. So that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, really quick, no, unf unfortunately, no financial disclosures to reveal. Um, in interest of full disclosure, I am the neuropsychologist within the St. Luke's uh, Health Network, and I'm a member of the American Epilepsy Society Psychosocial Comorbidities and Non-Epileptic Seizure uh, Work Groups. Uh, everything I discuss today is my, own, is my own view and my own opinion. So individuals in Lehigh Valley are very fortunate. They have two comprehensive epilepsy centers that have been accredited by the National Association of Epilepsy Centers as a level three center. What the National Association of Epilepsy Centers is, is a group of professionals that set standards for comprehensive care of epilepsy, okay? And they wanna make sure that these centers have the right personnel and provide quality services for, for patients with epilepsy. And they set guidelines and standards. And these are pretty much what those standards are in terms of services uh, at, at a level three. And both St. Luke's uh, Epilepsy Center and Lehigh Valley Health Network Epilepsy Center are accredited as, as, a, uh, as a level uh, three uh, center. So that's, that's, that's pretty remarkable to have that access. Um, as you can see uh, down here, what's needed is neuropsychological and psychological services. As I said, to provide both neuro, uh, neuropsychological assessment and psychological services to individuals. They go further to define what a neuropsychologist in a comprehensive epilepsy center should do, okay? Like I mentioned, a big part of what we do is we do assessment to, to help individuals understanding their strengths and weaknesses in terms of their thinking, to help compensate for any difficulties that, may, uh, that they may experience to improve their daily living, to, uh, their, 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 uh, their functioning on the job, or their interpersonal functioning. We also assist, uh, by doing these assessments, we also assist in identifying possibly where seizures are coming from to help uh, the, neuro, uh, the neurologist, the epileptologist, and the neurosurgeons when preparing a, a patient who may be considering surgery. Um, and we also, uh, focus on treating individuals with non-epileptic seizures. We know that there's a high prevalence of individuals who are admitted to the epilepsy monitoring unit who are diagnosed not with epilepsy, but non-epileptic seizures, approximately 40%. But we also know that individuals with 
epilepsy are at increased risk for non-epileptic seizures as well. There's a high comorbidity there. So neuropsychologists in an epilepsy center um, are, are, are expected to kind of attend to those, to those needs as well. And what I'm here to talk about today is to uh, identify and help uh, treat um, psychological symptoms um, that's associated with uh, living with epilepsy. We know that psychiatric disorders are much more common in persons with epilepsy than, yeah, PWEs, persons with epilepsy, I apologize. Uh, are, so uh, psychiatric disorders in general are more common in persons with epilepsy than they are in the general population. And that's not so uncommon with other chronic medical illness. That tends to be the trend. With chronic medical illness, there tends to be a higher prevalence of, of psychiatric symptoms, psychological symptoms, and, and diagnoses. What we see in, in epilepsy, are we see an elevated uh, prevalence of mood disorders. Um, you know, depression, bipolar, and we're gonna talk more in detail about these. Anxiety, um, personality disorders, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Substance use, um, psychotic disorders, but any type of psychological or psychiatric diagnosis that you can think of, it's gonna be at an increased risk in, in chronic illness and, and, and in epilepsy, sleep disorders, um, uh, learning disorders, uh, ADHD, um, impulse control disorders. You're gonna see some increased risks risk with epilepsy. And we, we'll talk about why on the next slide. I didn't know if this was it, but it is. So why do we see this, this heightened um, presence of, of psychological and emotional symptoms in, um, in epilepsy. Well, I have this discussion with my patients every time we meet. When you have a neurologic condition, you're at increased risk for symptoms because not only do you have a biological component that's contributing to the manifestation of, of mood symptoms, anxiety, depression, but then you have the reactive component. This, so what is it like living with a chronic illness? What is it like to have your independence and autonomy restricted, right? These are the reactive components to, to living with a chronic illness and with epilepsy. Also with epilepsy, um, like I said, there's the biological component. There's what's causing the epilepsy, if there's any type of neuropathology, whether it be um, genetic or structural, okay? And then there's the actual epileptic discharge, the actual seizures. Right, so constant seizure activity, subclinical seizure activity, um, seizure activity that won't remit. This places every this places individuals at risk for disturbance in mood. Okay, psychosocial factors. So, like I mentioned, public attitudes. How do people perceive you living with epilepsy? What's is there a stigma associated with living with epilepsy? Are people misinformed or have a poor understanding of what epilepsy is? Um, what is it, how does it impact your self-esteem? How does it impact your education or your employment and your relationships, okay? And then, um, as if that wasn't enough, then there's the uh, anti-epileptic medications, some which have adverse behavioral uh, effects, okay? So when you take this all into consideration, it's pretty understandable that having depression or having anxiety in epilepsy, having cognitive issues, memory issues, attention, it's not unexpected. It's actually probably typical and to be expected. And it should be nothing to be ashamed, it should, it shouldn't be, it should be nothing to be ashamed of, okay? Similar to that, um, uh, neuropsychologist Bruce Herman and his colleague, they said there are three risk factors that place people with epilepsy at, at an increased risk the neurobiologic brain-related factors like I covered. What's interesting is that in some cases, psychiatric symptoms appear before the onset of epilepsy. Okay, so before seizures begin. So we can't just attribute it to the seizures or the impact of the seizures on your um, independence, on autonomy. Some people will experience uh, psychiatric symptoms before the first seizure. And a lot of this is done in children where they look at um, educational issues, they look at behavioral issues, and a lot of these occur before seizure onset. So what is the idea? Well, maybe that there's a com common underlying neural substrate that's causing the behavior changes and the seizures. So there's a common cause, 
okay, and, and, it's, and, it, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a biological contribution, okay? And then the psychosocial factors and the iatrogenic meaning that it's, that it, that it's caused by some type of intervention, um, and, and such as medications, okay? So this kind of just summed up the previous slide. So when you look at studies and you look at the research saying, well, how common are psychiatric disorders and emotional symptoms in epilepsy? It varies, all right? It varies anywhere between 19% to 80%. That's quite, quite a range, right? The reason why these studies vary considerably is because, one, the samples that are used are so different, okay? You have some people who are, um, you know, and a lot of it is based on, on a tertiary care, so individuals who have the most significant, uh, severe, difficult to treat epilepsy, okay? So those, are, those will be at the higher range versus a clinic where they see people that are just managed by medication and going on with life. They might be at the lower end. So that's, that counts for some of the, di the difference. Also, these studies use different methodologies. How are they assessing depression? How are they assessing anxiety? So that's why there's a lot of uh, variability in, the stu in, in studies. But two community-based studies, which is kind of the gold standard for this, they reported prevalence rates about anywhere between 37 and uh, both studies. One said 37, one said about 23. So, so it's, it's pretty common. So if you think about 37, you know, maybe one in three people will have some type of psychological disturbance. The most common is depression, okay? So depression can be seen in anywhere between 20 to 60 percent of persons with epilepsy, where as in the general populations, it's anywhere about 5 to 20, okay? Um, it's estimated that depression occurs into uh, less, it's, it's less uh, prevalent in individuals with controlled epilepsy versus those with uncontrolled. And it's not just because the seizures aren't controlled, because maybe this is, there's a, a greater biological component, maybe there's a greater uh, contribution from the medications, okay? And symptoms are, that are typically seen in individuals with epilepsy, they tend to experience dysthymia, which is maybe not a severe depression, but it's a consistent, mild depression, kind of like a eh, indifferent, all right? Where if somebody were to ask you, you probably would say, well, I'm not depressed, but your behavior is just kind of, it's, it's mild and it's persistent. It doesn't let up. Irritability is another common uh, symptom of depression in, in epilepsy. Anhedonia. Has anybody, does anybody know what anhedonia is? No, it's a fancy word. It's the, it's the loss, uh, it's the inability to experience pleasure. So things that you once enjoyed, people, activities, that's gone, and hopelessness. Now, anhedonia actually is one of the best predictors of depression in, uh, in epilepsy because it's not a, a physical symptom. There's a lot of physical symptoms of depression. Some of those overlap with, with actual seizures. So you have to be careful when you're assessing, is it, are you looking at somebody's seizure symptoms or is this an actual symptom of depression? Anhedonia tends to be a good predictor as well as hopelessness because these aren't physical symptoms. They're not somatic. They're not physical. So like I said, depression may pre precede, may come before the onset of seizures. And this kind of suggests that there's an increased risk. So if you have epilepsy, you're at an increased risk for depression. If you have depression, you're going to be at an increased risk for epilepsy. Okay, especially if there's a common underlying neural substrate that's contributing to both. Okay. And again, I think just having a diagnosis of epilepsy will put you at an increased risk, but some studies show that, you know, having temporal lobe epilepsy may be, put you at a higher risk, and having multiple seizure types, which may suggest a more difficult and more complicated diagnosis, these put you at increased risk for depression. So why does this matter? Well, a study found that about 40% of individuals with epilepsy have untreated depression, okay? So it's often unrecognized or undiagnosed. Well, a majority of the focus when you go into a, to a doctor's office, they're focusing on seizures, okay? They're, and that's understandable. They're, that's something that, that needs to get treated. Sometimes the emotional symptoms take, take the back seat. Or and sometimes it's just, well, yeah, you should be depressed because you have epilepsy. 
but that's not, that's not the case, okay? It's worth talking about, it's worth discussing with your providers, and it's worth treating, okay? Comorbid depression in, in, in epilepsy has been associated with adverse events related to, to epileptic medications, anti-epileptic medications. It's, it's associated with increased uh, and more frequent doctor visits and medical bills, okay? It's, in, it's also increased with it for individuals who are un, or, or considering or undergoing surgery. Depression is associated with a, a, a poor outcome, a poor outcome following surgery to control seizures. So this is why it's, it's relevant. This is why it's important. It has not only an impact, it has an impact on your entire treatment, okay? Um, and additionally, Individuals with epilepsy are at increased risk for suicide and suicide attempts, where there is about 10 to 25 times greater than the, the general population. So this is why it's important to be aware and to, be, and to talk about it. So what's the treatment? Okay, I'm not, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't discuss medications in general, but I'll kind of just go through what's typically used. So antidepressants. SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, are commonly used. Some antidepressant medications actually have anticonvulsant properties, so you kind of get, you know, get a get double bang for your buck there. Okay, but you also want to make sure that you discuss this with your doctor, uh, if you're if you're if you have if your primary care doctor is thinking about prescribing, because some antidepressants will lower seizure threshold. So you want to make sure that your epileptologist is very much aware of what medications you're taking on and have them involved in that decision. Even, even some psychiatrists are not as uh, experienced in treating individuals with neurologic conditions. So it's important that everybody's aware of what you're taking because there are drug interactions that, that both sides should be aware of, okay? What I am trained in and what, I, what, I, what I'm more comfortable with is, this, is psychotherapy. So, Research shows that cognitive behavioral therapy, which I'm going to explain to you in one bit, just kind of social, introduce you to it, is effective in treating depression and, and anxiety in individuals with epilepsy when the focus is on the depression and the anxiety, not focusing on reducing seizures. The idea was that if you go into treatment for depression or anxiety, you focus on your seizures, that's gonna, that's gonna, you're going to reduce your seizures by having this treated. No, you, you want to focus on the actual depression and anxiety. So what's cognitive behavioral therapy? It's a type of therapy that focuses on in-the-moment problems. Okay? It's not lying on the couch talking about your childhood or talking about, you know, my mother did this and, you know, my father did that. So all the mothers are safe. Okay? Um, what they're talking about, problems that are in the moment, okay? So you discuss a situation. So the idea is this. Your thoughts, your mood or your emotions, your behavior, and your physical reactions are all related. One influences the next. A situation will provoke, will provoke the thought. Cognitive behavioral therapy focuses on thoughts. The idea is, since these are all related, if you adjust or restructure your thoughts, you'll experience an improvement in mood and change in your behavior. So let's kind of, let's have an example. Let's say, um, let's say you had a seizure and um, you're tired, you're fatigued, so, you know, instead of going out with friends, you're just going to stay home because you're physically exhausted. That's the situation. The thought is, they really don't like me anyway. Now they're definitely not going to like me because I'm, I'm bailing on them. Okay? What kind of mood would that be associated with? What do you think? Depression? Sadness, right? What kind of behavior? Say, seclusion? Yeah, great. Kind of staying in bed, a, a motivated. What kind of reaction? Just kind of feeling blah, right? So what cognitive behavioral therapy would help you kind of walk through that. And they'll say, okay, well, what evidence do you have that they didn't want you to go in the first place? Did they invite you? Would they have gone out of their way to invite you? If, you, if, if, you, if your friend had a seizure and decided to stay home and not want to go out, would you understand? Would you not want to be with that friend? 
No. So these are restructuring the thoughts, okay, which is hard to do when, you're, when the mood is dictating it. So now by restructuring, what do you think is going to happen to the mood? It's going to improve, right? Are you guys feeling better now? <laughs> All right. What is going to happen with the behavior? It's going to change. And then by changing the behavior, it's also going to impact the mood, and you're going to notice a lift. That's cognitive behavioral therapy. It's, it's been shown to be very, very effective in just treating anxiety and depression across the board, but more so, it's also been validated with, it, with, um, it, with epilepsy. Okay? And, and um, in general, it's shown to be as effective as medication, but the good news is once you stop cognitive behavioral therapy, guess what happens? You continue to benefit from it because you start doing these exercises on your own as, a, as opposed to if you just stop medication, what do you think happens? comes back, right? It's likely to come back. So that's, that's cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay? I'm slightly biased. Now, there are different types of therapy. There's psychodynamic therapy. There's interpersonal therapy. Everybody has their own therapy. They change it a little bit, and they put their own name on it. They put their picture next to it, and they sell it. Okay? Um, this has been shown to be very, very effective in treating anxiety and depression. And guess what? It's not like five years. It actually can be quite short, a month or so. Okay, you start seeing benefit. Okay? All right. So kind of sticking with, with mood disorders, let's talk about bipolar. Bipolar disorder is a, a, a disorder that's char characterized by periods of depression and also periods of ma mania, okay, manic symptoms, which are, can be extreme agitation, insomnia, but not, not the insomnia where you just can't fall asleep. You just don't want to fall asleep. You have the energy, you don't, you don't need sleep. Um, it's also associated with hypersexuality, poor decisions, grandiosity, you know, thinking that you know, you're, you're superhuman. Um, could have, it could be associated with psychotic symptoms and also ge a general feeling of euphoria. Nothing can stop you, okay? Individuals with bipolar disorder, when, when they're in the manic phase, they're not seeking treatment because they don't think they need it. Okay, it's when they, when they come back down and that they hit that depression. So within epilepsy, the prevalence is thought to be around 8%. Okay? The, the benefit here is that treatment with anti-epileptic medications treats, treats bipolar disorder. In the, in the general population, individuals without epilepsy, they are typically prescribed um, different types of anti-epileptic medications. You see these names? They're like familiar. Those are used to treat bipolar disorder in general, okay? So the idea is if you have these symptoms, they may be also treated with some of the medications that, that are treating the epilepsy, okay? Anxiety, it's a very general term. It looks very different in everyone. Um, it's probably the most second common uh, psychiatric uh, disorder, but it tends to be forgotten. When you go to your doctor's office, you might fill out a form about depression, right? How many people, when you go to a doctor's office, you fill out a depression form, whether it's a couple items or, right? How many fill out anxiety forms? No, you don't even know what it looks like, right? It tends to go under-recognized, okay? But it's occurring in about 10 to 50% of individuals. That's worth recognizing, in my opinion. And guess what? Anxiety and depression often co coexist. It's very rare to have one without the other. You may have, that may happen when you're too depressed to be anxious, okay? But 10 to 50%, that needs to be recognized, whereas in the general population, it's occurring 2 to 5%, okay? So what are, so what are uh, different types of disorders? So there's panic attacks, right? People kind of know what, what those are. It's, you know, you, these kind of, intense feelings of, um, that come out of the blue. They tend to be more physiological, where you know, you increase heart rate, trembling, sweating, things like that. Um, generalized anxiety disorder, I call that worrying about worrying. You worry about everything. You hear, you hear an ambulance, you think you know, one of your relatives is, is in the ambulance. You're worried about finances, you're worried about everything, okay? To the point where you worry the fa by the fact that you're worrying. Okay, it's, that's, it's very general. Obsessive compulsive disorder, I'm sure you're familiar with that. It's where you have these obsessions um, 
which are, which are thoughts that are kind of, and these compulsions, which are behaviors that you need to do to relieve the, the, um, the uh, obsessions. A big, a big common thread in all anxiety disorders is avoidance. You're trying to avoid all of uh, the, the anxiety. You're trying to avoid the, um, the physical symptoms. You're trying to avoid the worry. And you, it's all maladaptive behavior that, that is trying to alleviate, but all it does is exacerbate. It's making it worse, okay? So when people come in with all these names, I, I think it's important to understand what symptoms, but understand that it's, it's, it's common, okay? It's a common, there's a common thread, and if you pull out that thread, all of this will kind of fall, away, fall apart. So there are and there are other different anxiety disorders, but these are ones that are fairly common in epilepsy. Those SSRI medications that I mentioned before, they're, they're recommended in treating anxiety. So, you know, like I said, it's, it's not uncommon to have both depression and anxiety. The same medications treat both. A lot of times people are afraid to bring up depression because then they'll have to bring up their anxiety and they feel like, oh, my doctor's going to think I'm, I'm crazy or, you know, I, I have so many problems. It's, it's expected that these co-occur, all right? So there's nothing to be, to be ashamed of. Benzodiazepines such as clozapam and alprazolam, they're used in treating symptoms of panic disorder and generalized um, anxiety disorder. Uh, the, uh, but guess what else is used? Cognitive behavioral therapy. The same model that I walked you through with that depressive example, we can go ahead and give an example for anxiety as well, okay? And it, it works the same way. So psychotic disorders, psychotic disorders are characterized by, you know, you know, there could be visual hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, there could be delusional thought processes, okay, and like I said, psych psychosis can be a symptom of bipolar disorder as well, but they, they can occur on their own. So what's important with psychotic disorders is you need to understand when they're occurring because they can also be a symptom of epilepsy, okay? People can have episodes of psychotic during of psychosis during seizures people can have have it leading up to a seizure okay or right after post psychosis okay individuals can also have it interactively when there's no seizure activity in between okay so understanding when they when it's occurring is very important and if it's part of the seizure presentation, it's important because that's going to help, uh, help your providers with the treatment, okay? Because it may be a little bit different depending on when. Yes? Could you just offer a few most common examples of what a psychotic situation might look like? Um, it could be um, delusional thought process. So maybe, you know, paranoid thought, <laughs> paranoid thinking. Um, it could be accompanied by auditory and visual hallucinations, okay? which also can be seizures. So it's, it's important to help, to help for your providers to differentiate that. But it's just a very, it's loosely based thought processes, okay? And this, and this is not so, it's, it's not very common, okay? Um, it can be seen up to 10, oops, sorry, up to 10%. Um, that's, that's the higher end, okay? But in general populations, it's three. But again, it could be, it's not, it could be seen after, um, after seizure as part of the postictal presentation. And I think postictal psychosis, it's pretty much in there where once the seizure stops up to like a week, it's considered postictal. Okay. So what are some risk factors? So, um, you know, bilateral, uh, bilateral seizure, uh, bilateral involvement in seizures. Temporal lobe epilepsy can be a risk factor. So in terms of the age of onset and psychosis onset, so they say usually psychosis will occur um, about 10 years after seizure onset. So that's that 11 to 15 years after seizure onset. So you, it's, it's individuals leave, living with epilepsy for a while, okay? Um, and then more severe epileptic processes, so longer duration, multiple seizure types, history of status epilepticus, poor responsive treatment, this will put you at risk for, for psychosis. And then there's this concept of forced normalization, which is interesting, it's somewhat controversial, I think, but this is when um, it's the emergence of psychotic symptoms following the establishment of seizure control. So it's in individuals who have, who have chronic epilepsy, 
typically refractory to medications, once it's established, once seizures are controlled, and the EEG looks normal, psychotic symptoms come on. Okay? Again, it's somewhat, it's somewhat of, and it's rare. Okay? So it, it's, no, it's, not, it's, it's not a contraindication to having seizures treated. But it, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon that's been observed. But this is a different type of presentation and may mean a different type of treatment, which is why if the onset of seizures occur after, I mean, if the onset of psychosis occurs after um, seizures have been controlled, then your, your, your doctors are going to want to look at your medications and see what they need to do. So it's important to establish not only what type of symptoms, but when are they occurring. Are they occurring when you're fine and having no seizures at all? Are they occurring once seizures are treated? Are they occurring leading up to the seizure? Or are they occurring right after the seizure or during? So most individuals with interictal psychosis, meaning you know, in the period when they're not having seizures, it's not the forced normalization, they're typically treated with antipsychotic medications. Um, olanzapine, uh, Zyprexa, and Risperidone, Risperidol are frequently used because they're le less likely to exacerbate seizures. That's another thing, you know, when providers are, um, s are prescribing medications for any type of psychiatric illness, depression, psycho, you want to keep in mind, um, you know, how is this interacting with other medications, and um, is this going to reduce seizure threshold, because some of these medications will. That's why it's very important to talk with your epileptologist about this, especially if it's coming from a PCP or, or general provider. So personality disorders, have anybody heard about a personality, have you heard about personality disorders? Yes, some people, they're not as common as uh, some of the other uh, uh, diagnoses that I mentioned. So they're not studied as much, um, except within the specialties there. But a personality disorder is a persisting trait. It's a characterological trait of thinking, behavior, emotion that is maladaptive and it interferes significantly with your ability to form relationships and, and function, whether it's at work or at school. That's the general term. And then they try to break it down into different clusters, which we'll talk about. But in, um, so these are less frequent side, but it's estimated about anywhere between 16 to 21% um, of individuals with epilepsy will demonstrate personality, uh, the traits of a personality disorder, okay? Cluster A is typically, um, it, you know, it, it has three, and these are broken in clusters because of commonalities in presentation, okay? So cluster A, paranoid, it's what it sounds like, okay? Just, it's, uh, you, there's, mis, uh, you know, there's mistrust, but it's to the extent that you can't form relationships, okay? Uh, schizoid, it's not schizophrenia, okay? Schizoid is a, it's, it's a, um, this is more like an avoidant. You know, you just kind of keep to yourself. You just, you want nothing to do with other individuals. It's almost like the person living in the cabin, isolating themselves, okay? It's to the point where it, 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 it's interfered with their function. Schizotypal is just kind of more of the eccentric personality type, but it's to the point where it's interfering with, with relationships and, and functioning. Cluster B, um, these are some of the more common ones that people may have heard of in, in mass media. So antisocial is not what you think of. Antisocial is not a person who doesn't want to talk to you or kind of wants to be by himself. Antisocial is a very, it's a very manipulative um, uh, type of personality trait. It's a disregard for others and the emotions of others. So this is somebody who will, um, you know, uh, you know, um, Serial killers, okay? That's, that's, a, that's, that's a generalization, but that's the typical type of pattern, you know? They may be friendly, they may warm up to you, and then, yeah. Anyway, borderline personality disorder is characterized by this really difficulty uh, with emotional regulation. It's, you know, um, it's uh, some people you know, one time they love, somebody loves them, the other time they're out to get them. So it's kind of back and forth and it, and it fluctuates very quickly. Okay, and it's difficulty just e e regulating emotions. You know, it's not uncommon for individuals with, border, with borderline personality disorder to engage in self-injurious behavior. Okay, because it's their attempt to, to control emotions. I'm getting a sign. Ten minutes left, all right. I'll get through it. 
Narcissistic is what it seems. Histrionic is just like emotions are everywhere. Okay. Um, cluster C, avoidant, dependent, obsessive, compulsive. Those are pretty much what they are. What they sound like. Avoidant is not because they don't want to engage socially. It's just that they feel inadequate. Okay. They feel unworthy. Okay. But they want that. But they can't. They can't. Dependent. It's just that very needy. Um, you know they needy dependent personality and obsessive compulsive is pretty much that perfectionism okay these are these are not states though they're not good one day uh, and and bad the next these are persistent they're they're characterized throughout the person's life okay in epilepsy we see more cluster C okay um, there's no significant relationships identified between different personality disorders and seizure types. With, within cluster C, there's relationships between age of onset, duration of epilepsy, seizure frequency, and, and the number of medications, okay? And remember, this is the cluster C, the avoidance, the dependence, and the obsessive compulsive. Think about it, living with a chronic illness, that's, that's not uncommon, okay? Especially if it's, if it's an early onset and people are treating you a certain way, okay? You're gonna develop these tendencies. Um, and with surgery, you know, cluster A, you want to be aware of this because if you're considering surgery, you may be at increased risk for psychosis during video monitoring when they're withdrawing medications or immediately after surgery. So it's important to know. That's why, that's why it matters. Uh, cluster B, you may experience an int intensifying, uh, intensification of the symptoms. Those are those, the, the borderline personality disorders, the antisocial, okay? And cluster C, there's no significant risk necessarily associated with surgery for symptom ex exacerbation. So, again, it's important to assess for this, okay? And as a neuropsychologist, that's one of my jobs, not only my focus on cognition, but it's the assessment. Because they're under-recognized and they're under-diagnosed. So there are different ways to assess these. You can sit with a, a psychologist or psychiatrist and they can go through a structured interview, asking you all these questions, checking these boxes. Um, Self-report questionnaires, like sometimes you get at the doctor's office, or more long uh, objective personality questionnaires, like you'll have as part of a, a, a comprehensive evaluation. Um, I, th I think what's most important is the self-report questionnaires for screening in clinic, because that's, that's going to be the first line of defense is when you're meeting with your epileptologist, sh they need to identify, hey, is there any risk, for, is there any depression, depression or anxiety that needs further evaluation? Okay, and like I said before, anxiety tends to go underdiagnosed. It's the focus on depression. So I recently worked with some colleagues from University of Virginia, and we published a paper um, uh, validating two screening measures that have been developed. Well, I didn't develop them, but I, I validate them in, in epilepsy in persons with epilepsies. So these are short questionnaires, six, six or eight items. You get and you check off, and if you reach a certain level, it's like, well, yeah, we need to monitor anxiety and depression. The most important thing is that this not, not only includes depression, but it's focused on anxiety as well. Um, so like I said, diagnostic issues, we need to determine when, this, when these symptoms are occurring. Are they part of the seizure presentation? We need to know if the anti-epileptic medications are contributing, like Keppra. One of the biggest side effects is behavioral, okay? And some may cause even suicidality or suicidal ideation. Um, psychiatric symptoms have been associated with surgical treatment, especially following uh, anterior temporal lobectomy, uh, three to 12 months post-surgery. So you might be at an increased, increased risk following surgery for depression or anxiety. And the biggest predictor of that is if you have untreated pre-surgical depression or anxiety, which is why we need to identify it and treat it. Um, but then some people experience improvement of mood following surgery as well. Um, all of these will impact quality of life. So depression was, and anxiety were found to be associated with a poorer quality of life, above and beyond seizure variables. So take away seizure uh, severity, take away seizure frequency. Depression and anxiety by, its, by themselves was a gr stronger predictor of poorer quality of life, okay? Meaning what? Unemployment, so, uh, limited social support, um, uh, stigma, okay? So, in summary, we know that uh, epilepsy is associated with higher prevalence of psychiatric disorders and symptoms compared to the general population. We know that depression and anxiety are the two most common, okay? Psychiatric comorbidities are associated with clinical and psychosocial outcomes, which is why it ma matters. It's important to understand that the, pres the presentation of these symptoms um, and understand when they occur, okay? 
so because that may impact treatment. Screening for and identifying these symptoms is, is vital, okay? And again, psychopharmacological and therapies, CBT, have been found to be effective in treating these symptoms. All right, so now, who's this? All right, that's Dr. Elizabeth de Padua, <laughs> all right? She's our medical, she's the, the medical director of our epilepsy center. Dr. Kui Lim, over here, one of our epileptologists. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chad Saunders, he's not here, he didn't make it. Scott Kohler, one of our other epileptologists, and uh, Dr. Stephen Falowski, our neurosurgeon, and they told me I couldn't fit on the screen, so they left me out. <laughs> Thank you all for your time, I appreciate it. Any questions? By the way, you made it under 10 minutes. Oh, thank you. You were timing me? I saw you take out the stopwatch. As a neuropsychologist, I'm used to stopwatches. It's 8.56. It's 8.56. Yeah, I said 8.56. That's right. Yes, sir. I have an 11-year-old son with epilepsy. OK. And last six or 12 months, he started to go to the and someone like talked about it. My wife and I have been talking about taking him and see a neuropsychologist. The problem is he's adamantly against it. He's against it. Yes. How should we handle that situation? I don't think anybody wants to come see me. <laughs> I've yet to meet the person who was happy to see me. The idea is um, I, would I, would, I would try to explain to him that this is part of the epilepsy, not different. Just like a seizure is a symptom of epilepsy, this is a symptom of epilepsy, OK? Not as this own diagnosis, whether it's behavioral or, or um, you know, depression by itself, I would kind of conceptualize it as part of the, ep as part of epilepsy. It's sometimes people are a little bit more amenable to, to, to at least getting the conversation started. And the that doesn't help? Is it because I know it? <laughs> <laughs> well, has he had a neuropsychological evaluation for cognition? <coughs> okay. So sometimes having some, having him evaluated for, um, for cognitive concerns, that gets the foot in the door, and these other uh, symptoms can be at least assessed or addressed. Okay? Well, well, again, it depends how severe it is. It depends how. That's going to do more harm than good. Well, it depends. If it's, you know, if it's severe to the point where he needs medication, then that's part of his care, you know, then you maybe can have that talk with his epileptologist who may have that rapport with him and may be able to, it's not mom or dad. Um, uh, if you think, you know, again, if it's, maybe explain that if it's for therapy, if it's just an outlet, giving him an outlet where he has a safe place to talk about whatever's on his mind, yeah. even if he goes there for the first few times and doesn't say anything, it's completely up to him. Big thing with epilepsy is lack of control. So you want to foster and facilitate a sense of control. And if that's just sitting in an office, that's fine. But at least try it. And let's, and let's, and let's see where it goes. I think the best thing is to ask him uh, that's what, uh, the best Yeah, and it seems like he. What are you concerned about? Because part of the answer is knowing what are the concerns. Right? And then try oh, I guess some, identifying what the barriers, why he doesn't want to go and then addressing those barriers. He if he's 11, it may be just because. <laughs> he's got anger control issues, a lot of anxiety. Yeah. It's, it's not a rational at all. Yeah. 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 So I think it's trying to facilitate that sense of control, which is, you're right, you just don't want to force it, but saying, hey, this is, a, this is a place where you can just go and talk about anything you want without worrying about me or mom finding out. That might get the foot in the door. That's all we need to do is get the foot in the door. Yes, sir. Yeah, please do. This is the best type of. Oh, uh, sir, I think we have somebody with.
Well, it's because there's probably this stigma where they think I'm crazy. What's, you know, it's the unknown, it's the uncertainty, you know, which is scary. So I think conceptualize as part of the epileptic condition and, and facilitating um, control like this gentleman was suggesting, that might be the best point. And just saying, hey, this is just another approach because we know that it can make things worse, right? So that, that, try that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Question. Uh, as far as any type of mood or personality symptoms, interactively, mm -hmm. uh, is it seen ever, I know I've, I've seen it here, where as you get closer, like further, like more time between seizures, that things worsen, and then when the seizure occurs, then after that. Yeah, that's very common. It so is? that can be part of this, this periictal presentation. Mm where it's almost like, you know, kind of this buildup that's leading up to the seizure. Right. Mood is part of that symptom, part of that buildup. And that, sometimes that's how people know they're going to have a seizure. Like things can upset the person a lot more at those times. And yep. Things that after the seizure wouldn't bother them at well, all. Well, think about what's going on. If there's, a, if there's any compromise to these brain areas that are responsible for regulating emotions, for controlling emotions, yeah. that's going to go. And this would be with temporal lobe epilepsy and yeah. complex Yep, which is, you know, very much involved in emotion. So that can be part of the presentation. And some people know that they're going to have a seizure based on that. They can feel that agitation. So it's part of that periectal. Well, that's something that, as far as the processes, like, like if a person gets so obsessed about, like, people doing something bad to them or something, and they'll actually lose sleep. They can't get to sleep because the thoughts are... Yeah, like that's... Behavior yeah, that's... Ab yeah, absolutely. Because what's keeping them up are the thoughts. Now, there might be that biological component that they may not be able to turn that off, but, yeah. but therapy will help with that to some degree. Just and there may be some medication, too, to help with sleep. Yeah, we, we tried some of them. You got very tired with them. You yeah. You put around the lanzapine and respiratory. Yeah, well, they're pretty it serious. They'll help. It seems worse than the... Oral yeah, and then what happens when you don't sleep? Yeah. Right? So it's a, it's a vicious cycle. So therapy can help with maybe helping to some degree with those thoughts that keeping them up. Yes, sir. I'm in college. And yeah. I have learning disabilities plus seizures. Okay. And is there any signs of, you know, for me later in life, because I'm 25, mm -hmm. is there any signs of, you know, for me later in life that I will have possible problems with, like, seizures and with uh, the learning disabilities. Like, is there so I think you're, so fantastic job. So you're in college? I'm in college. Great, what yeah. year? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, but you're I'm, doing the work. I'm doing the work, but I'm having a lot of issues with the anxiety. Right. But I'm wondering, is there any issue with having all this anxiety from the seizures? But is there any signs with having learning disabilities plus the seizures and the anxiety? So the anxiety, so the anxiety can be treated with mm -hmm. what we're talking about, yeah. right? And anxiety can also anxiety. trigger seizures, yeah. right? So that's that's important. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing to compensate mm -hmm. to help you get through what you're doing, mm -hmm. that's going to help you later in life as well. So just keep doing what you're doing, mm -hmm. all right? I think because those resources mm -hmm. that you're using yeah. are going to help you as you get older and move on to the next stage. Yeah, but is there something later in life? that I, will, I could notice that could end up making me feel horrible? Um, so, is, so in terms of your mood, it can be yeah. treated. Mm -hmm. it, just because you have anxiety now doesn't mean it's going to get worse mm -hmm. down the line, uh, as long as it's treated. Okay. okay? Great. Great job, too. Yeah. Anyone else? No time? No time. But I mean, Thank you all. Afterwards. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>